Welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today, Debunking Dangerous Misconceptions About Privileged Access Management, featuring our guest speaker, Dave Shackelford, who is the founder and principal consultant with Voodoo Security, as well as stands analyst, instructor, and course author, and GIAC technical director. So um, a really fun guy. Um, we're excited to have him here today. Um, you're also joined by Beyond Trust Deputy CTO Christopher Hill, who will briefly explain Beyond Trust concept of universal privilege management after Dave's portion, so please stick around for that. My name is Sarah, your webinar host today. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, a reminder that everybody's line is muted, but please keep this interactive and submit your questions live through the GoToWebinar console at any point. I will be monitoring those and we'll host live Q&A at the end. Um, also, today's webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a follow-up email containing links to the recording and slides shown here today within about one to two business days from now. The slides can also be downloaded via the handout section now if you'd like to follow along. Um, today's webinar is being um, recorded and you will receive um, links. I already said that. Sorry, guys. And then finally, if you're attending for CPE credits with ISACA, you can locate and download the attendance verification document in the handout section now. Submit proof that you attended today's webinar. If you're attending for CPE credits um, with ISC squared, your CPEs will automatically be applied to your account within four to six weeks. I know I have a lot to get through in the beginning, so thanks for bearing with me, everybody. Okay, it is time to jump in. Um, let's welcome Dave to the line. Hey, Dave, we are ready for you. Um, are you ready for us? It's It might be a little, we're, we're not really sure, huh? <laughs> well, as ready as I'm going to be, absolutely. So. <laughs> Goodness. Yeah. So um, thanks for having me, Sarah, and thanks everybody for being here. This is Dave Shackelford. I am a little hoarse, <laughs> so we were just laughing about this before we started. And so uh, I, I, I usually have this sort of almost obnoxiously booing voice, but uh, I am going to be a little more muted than, uh, than normal. Hopefully you guys can, can at least hear me. So um, we're on the fun and exciting title slide. That's only fun and exciting for so long. So if we could go to the next slide, we will get this party started. Okay, Dave, let's get you to the next slide. There you go. There we go. Awesome. So, uh, you know, I, I probably don't have to state this. I, I always sort of joke that I, I tend to start these webcasts with a, sort of a Captain Obvious slide, and this is probably one of them. But I, I think what we're starting to see out there is, is a dawning realization that's, you know, been coming for the last maybe 10 years that <laughs> there's, we have an enormous number of types of privileged access and and you know that sort of compounds in most of our organizations not necessarily to lead to a definite breach i mean obviously that's not always the case but it certainly increases the risk that we could have intrusions or we could experience some sort of a breach situation and you know obviously what this means for us as we go through and evaluate the different types of, uh, you know, just administrative accounts and the privilege models that we've created and how we've actually uh, <clears throat> sort of allowed those to gain access to both internal resources or even coming from, you know, outside the organization. Uh, I think the, the, the bigger realization has been it's, it's really gotten out of hand. And, and certainly for large organizations, looking at things like partners, um, you know, vendors, uh, looking at even customer um, potential access for, doing, uh, you know, proof of concept with things that we're building for them, et cetera, that you start realizing it, it's a big, big landscape that we've been sort of letting grow and we've got a lot of different access that needs to be curtailed. Well, as such, as we have come to that realization, and I think, uh, you know, security teams and, and the security community really started talking about this problem specifically, you know, I mean, it's probably 15 years ago when I remember seeing this, you know, this discussion really get going. And uh, to, to sort of combat that, we've come up with sort of solution models that fall into this category called privileged access management, or PAM. But in my time in security, which is, you know, just about two decades now, I don't know that I've seen very many products or tools or suites of these types of tools that have had more misconceptions 
swirling around about them. And, and if you ask 10 different people in the security community, sort of what their perception of PAM and PAM products and sort of what, you know, the, the suites that are available and what they're supposed to do and where they fit, you're probably going to get 10 completely different or at least somewhat different answers because there's a lot to do here, right? I mean, I think when we're talking about the topic of privileged access, it, it, it sort of crawls all over the place, right? We've got, again, we've got sort of vendor access, we've got our own admins, we've got application scenarios, we've got tons of different types of credentials that we've got to accommodate for. We've got lots of different uh, sort of integration scenarios, um, both again with internal applications as well as cloud-based services and resources, you name it, somehow or another, <laughs> privileged access management is probably tied into this stuff. So I, I think we have a lot to talk about, but there's also some sort of context I'd like to bring into the, uh, into the discussion. So let's go to the next slide, please. So, you know, I like to reference some industry guides and, and you know, some research. And I think most people are familiar with the Verizon DBIR. And this is the, one, the most recent one that's just come and and in this uh, most recent report, it, you know, really what you're seeing is some really serious trends that have uh, been going for a long time. So um, you can take a look here and see that they're clearly calling out, at least in the incidents that they evaluated, that privilege misuse is the number one pattern that they've seen in incidents. Now, when you go to breaches, this is certainly still in the top five, but it's not necessarily the number one that's always part of a breach but there's vastly more incidents than breaches. So it's a factor across the board. Incidents are no good. Breaches are really no good, but privilege misuse, I mean, it's sitting right up at the top of the list. And, you know, I think that just corroborates what I'm talking about. We have tons of different types of access and access models and, you know, trying to corral them all has really proved challenging for us. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to give an example because I think it's one of those that um, <clears throat> honestly sort of crept up on us. And this is just the, the whole concept of vendor remote access. So vendors basically having some sort of monitoring of our environment or potentially, you know, being able to come in and perform remote support or remote maintenance for any number of different reasons. And we've seen tons and tons of cases over the past 10 years or so of these remote vendor situations being used by attackers to sort of perpetrate an attack chain. So, we, I mean, we've known there are always risks with, with these types of access, but we have one, um, you know, sort of uh, privileged access model in the form of vendor access that has escalated, I mean, I'd say almost exponentially since probably around 2011, 12, 13. And, uh, you know, it's also one of those things where you create these vendor ecosystems or partner ecosystems are really just third parties. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm calling it remote vendor access, but that's really just one form of this. But it's, it's remote third parties of some form that we've got relationships with. Um, you know, we've got partners, we've got vendors, and there has been a ton of abuse of this. And so this is another one that we have to try to reel in, and it's been, uh, you know, extraordinarily difficult. So let's go to the next slide, and it'll give us an example. And this is one of those examples that I, I think most people in the security industry are probably familiar with. Um, you know, they've probably seen this one. So we go to the next slide, there. Yeah, thank you. So um, this, this is one of my favorite examples. It's not the most recent, but it, it's, it's an incredibly important one simply due to the implications of what it meant. So, you know, OPM obviously is a, a, you know, a government agency that is responsible for doing things like background checks and in particular background checks for, you know, pretty much everybody. But, you know, we're talking about federal contractors in the defense space, people that are working with, you know, really sensitive data and sensitive materials and go through extensive background checks to be able to, you know, even do work with those types of agencies and organizations. And um, the way that this thing went down ultimately came down to the fact that, hey, this, uh, you know, this, this agency, they've got connected partners and connected organizations for a variety of parts of, of the way their organization runs as well. 
Um, and it's huge because uh, there were a bunch of sensitive records related to people's background checks, which includes staggering realms of personal data. So if any of you guys have ever gone through a serious background check with, with the federal government in the U.S., you know exactly what I'm talking about. This, this includes, you know, family members and, and all of their data. It includes friends and associates going way back. It includes jobs you've had. It includes addresses. It includes, you know, all this information that was ultimately disclosed as a result of initial ingress through a related third party. Let's go to the next slide. And this really, you know, sort of begs the question, well, how did it happen? And <clears throat> to be fair, there was a lot of transparency around this, or at least enough transparency for all of us in the security industry to learn some things <clears throat> and actually derive some things out of this. And so what we really believe happened was uh, basically a credential hijack with uh, a background check contractor that was, you know, kind of tasked with doing a lot of these processing uh, tasks and, and things. And um, they, they used that to gain access coming in because they had that initial ingress access in the first place. So what you're, what you're really seeing here is just, again, a hybrid connectivity scenario with privileged access. These guys coming in, got access to system resources, and used that to, of course, steal this data. And then there's been lots of, you know, things thrown around. You know, was it the Chinese government or was it, you know, a, a some sort of a state actor? There's still question marks about that. I mean, I, you know, again, I, I'm not going to get into attribution here, but this wasn't that sophisticated. That's the thing. These guys had remote access. Privileged access was leveraged against that. So let's go to the next slide. And, and this is a great example of privileged access, but this is an insider. So, you know, you, you look at this, and for those of you that don't know the story about Georgia Pacific, this one happened just back in 2017, so not that long ago. But it's a phenomenal example of insider threat, but it should have been one that was controlled. And so there was a, a sysadmin that basically created a, a backdoor VPN connection. And, and, you know, so you go, well, wait a minute. Who was paying attention to the VPN? Who was in charge of the VPN? And there had to have been at least other admins. I mean, this is a huge company. Georgia Pacific's a massive uh, fortune organization. So it, it probably wasn't one person. Um, and, you know, the, the, the nature of this is, <clears throat> this person's access wasn't cut off even after he was no longer part of the organization. So <clears throat> what, what happened? Again, wh why did this fall down? And this is a place where, I mean, it's a perfect example, really, where PAM and PAM Solutions could have played a significant role in deterring this attacker from causing the damage that he did. You know, again, over a million dollars in damage as a result of him coming back, you know, as a disgruntled former employee that chose to come back in through the solicit method. So, Again, a great example shows you how there's just so many avenues of ingress. Again, these are both remote access types of examples. Um, there's plenty of inside or internal types of examples that go along with this as well. So let's go to the next slide. And, and, and you know, this really sort of brings us to the question of the hour. You know, what's, what's the struggle? Um, you know, why, why does this feel like such a difficult solution that we're a little bit afraid of? And, you know, it's often cited as being, you know, these, these really you know, sort of difficult technologies that, you know, it's, it's tough to plan for and it's tough to implement. And so, you know, we don't want to, we don't, we don't rock, want to rock the boat and cause all these problems for people. It's going to create, you know, lots of headaches for admins or developers or both. But, but again, the reality is a lot of these, uh, you know, sort of perceptions that I'm listening here, you know, this breadth of how, how big this project's going to be. And, oh, it's so complex. And, oh, it's so difficult to use. Frankly, a lot of that's not always true. Um, you know, it can be. I mean, certainly not all products are created equal. But by and large, PAM is not a lot of the things that people have sort of cited that as being. What I'd like to do is go through and have some discussion around the key myths that we've traditionally seen arising within organizations out there sort of, you know, saying, well, here's things we believe are going to make it difficult to implement, or here's reasons why, you know, there's no way we could actually do PAM in our organization. Definitely not true. So let's get into it. Let's go to the next slide. So the first one, and I think this is a relevant factor today, because I think we all know <clears throat> that the term zero trust is getting a lot of traction out there. But what does it really mean? <laughs> you know, what does zero trust really consist of? And I know the guy that invented the term. He's a great guy. He's actually a friend of mine. His name's John Kinderbog. And we've had discussions about this over the years. And, and I think 
even he would agree that the term has been sort of twisted a little bit out in the market. But in essence, a zero trust type of philosophy, and it really is more of a philosophy than it is just a technology, um, it's got to include a bunch of things you know, to, to really be implemented to its fullest. I will tell you right off, I truly do not believe that it is possible today to successfully enact a 100% effective zero trust, uh, um, you know, sort of architecture or controls uh, framework. I think you can get close. I think there's a lot of tools and things that can help with this, but I really don't think you can truly achieve 100% zero trust. It would be amazing if you could. Um, and, and I think eventually we could get there, but the way things are today, and certainly with some of the issues that, that sort of are still out there, I think you just have to inch your way along. And I think Pam can actually be a big factor because one of the biggest factors or, or things to include as part of a zero trust uh, controls framework is identity and identity policy enforcement. And that covers the spectrum of accounts and privileged accounts and privilege in general and role assignment and where that all has to take place. And that even includes things like multi-factor authentication. In fact, maybe with some significant emphasis on things like multi-factor authentication and flexible multi-factor authentication. So zero trust, really cool idea. You know, I applaud John for, for sort of helping to shape our thinking on this, but it's really unlikely to truly get to zero trust. And people that think, you know, Pam is, you know, gonna get us 100% there and that's an expectation. I think it's very important to set the stage. Number one, we have a lot of technical debt and we're gonna have some technical debt. Very few organizations today can just start off with a greenfield environment, <clears throat> whether on-premise or cloud, and, and just take off. You know, we've got stuff that's, that, that we have to, bur we're burdened with. And legacy systems are right at the front of that. So what we have to do is keep in mind that, yes, we can have a parallel path. New technologies, you know, maybe cloud-based uh, infrastructure and newer application types of, of frameworks and workloads. But you're not necessarily going to see that technical debt go away quickly, nor legacy systems just immediately vanish. So it's tough to get to zero trust with all that in the mix. Likewise, as we're going through this, you know, quote unquote, digital transformation, um, you, you know, you're, you're dealing with a lot of hybrid environments that work in fundamentally different ways. And because they operate in different ways, and, and that could even be different cloud providers. If you're talking about things like Microsoft Azure versus AWS versus uh, you know, Google Cloud or, or you know, Oracle Cloud or any others, you have to make concessions for each to accomplish the goals that you're trying to get to as part of the zero trust. So well, I'm, uh, I think Pam can do a lot for us. Having an expectation that it's going to get us to, uh, you know, 100% effective zero trust model is, is just not realistic. So let's go to the next slide. So one thing that um, I, I see a lot of in terms of the you know, sort of myths around PAM is <clears throat> that you've got to have shared accounts to be able to facilitate a, a PAM solution. And that's, that's insane, right? I mean, shared accounts are actually a huge risk. So PAM does not require shared accounts. And, and frankly, if, if I was talking to a PAM solution provider that even mentioned that they had to have that, I, I'd probably immediately uh, disqualify that type of a vendor. So, they're tough to audit. You know, again, we, we've seen this case of everybody sharing root. Um, you know, we, we see those still out there. I mean, I'd love to, to think that this was completely gone in most enterprises and most organizations, but no, nope, we're, we're, you know, we're probably stuck with them, you know, to at least some degree, at least in certain cases. And there's a, pol a lot of politics around this, but let, let's just take Pam completely off the table. You absolutely do not have to have uh, shared accounts as part of a Pam solution. So boom, there's that myth gone. Let's go to the next slide. So let's also talk about what PAM is able to govern because one of the things that I hear is, well, you know, PAM, you know, it's, it, it, I mean, it's in the name, privileged. You can only manage privileged accounts with PAM. And, and so it makes it, you know, maybe sort of a small, uh, you know, sort of scope in terms of the applicability within our environment. And again, that really couldn't be further from the truth. Now I will say, if you've been in the industry for a long time, and you know I'm going back, you know, back to the you know 2000 to 2005, maybe 2010, I, I will say some of the early PAM solutions really were <clears throat> sort of hyper focused on just privileged accounts because that you know was what they were sort of billing themselves as. Today that's just not true. I mean, if you really get an enterprise class PAM solution, 
you're going to find that not only can PAM Solutions discover um, a variety of different privileged accounts across the environment, you know, and this could be everything from directory services to local accounts to application uh, accounts and, and things that are related to application workflows, but they should be able to find any accounts, really, that you point them at in, in different formats and different types. So it's not at all limited just to privileged accounts. That may be where you want to spend the most time, but PAM today, or at least robust PAM solutions, can govern a lot of things. You should also be able to use PAM to randomize and store passwords. So we're actually talking a bit of a secrets management um, scenario here as well. Enforcing least privilege access is a bare bones base minimum that PAM needs to be able to do. Controlling privileged remote access. Well, that brings us squarely back to some of the examples I just gave a minute ago. And it should be able to provide things like logging, behavior analysis of you know, the, the types of events and, and activities being seen, and even some threat profiling in the more mature types of solutions. So that's a lot. And again, that is exactly what I would expect in a mature PAM solution today. So no, <laughs> it's not just for managing privileged accounts, but that's an important part of it. It's for doing a lot of things that speak to privilege and the allocation of privilege. So let's go to the next slide. So another thing that I've heard a lot is, you know, oh, uh, you know, PAM can really only work with Active Directory. Or, or sometimes you'll hear people saying, well, it can only work with X, Y, or Z type of directory services. A again, that's not, that's not really true. You can use robust PAM to do a lot of things. Um, and that should be things like mobile accounts, cloud-based directories. So this is Azure Active Directory and others. And even things like Unix and Linux accounts, which have been notoriously challenging to sort of get our hands around it and, and sort of pull back from a central standpoint. So this one is definitely a myth. And, and frankly, I think this one's been a myth for a while, and it's just not true. Let's go to the next slide. Another big one. Um, so this one, I, I think, ties together. I think it ties together with some of the other myths. But what we've seen is a wide variety of, you know, sort of services and solutions cropping up out in the community that, that are sort of speaking to this concept of vendor management and vendor access. And one of those areas that's been making a lot of noise about this is, you know, the, the, the password manager solutions. Where they've been, you know, sort of making a claim that, you can, you can manage vendor access that's needed maybe sp uh, sporadically or you know, somewhat infrequently, and you can use password managers for that. I, I really don't think that's true, and, and certainly not for an enterprise, um, where you're going to have a lot of different types of vendor passwords and uh, third-party passwords, trying to manage that through some sort of a you know, central password management. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to say it couldn't be done to some degree, but it's hugely impractical. And you, you really will find, I think, in most cases that you need a much more robust platform in its own right to you know, help not only manage credentials that go along with this, but also to help um, you know, sort of manage the vendor access piece, which is things like network and even identity isolation, remote access. Again, if you go back to what we were talking about a minute ago, what we really would expect in a robust PAM uh, you know, platform or solution that, that remote access is a big part of it. You, you really don't tend to have vendors always coming on site. They're coming in from some sort of a you know, VPN kind of type of conduit or, or something else. So again, I think the myth that you can get away with managing vendor access with something small and simple really doesn't wash, and in, in, certainly not in big enterprises. So let's go to the next slide. And, and this will be my final myth, but it, it's a really important one. And, and this one might be the biggest one. <laughs> and I've heard this, I mean, I, I, I've heard this dozens of times over the past even few years when I've been working with clients and even speaking with students and, and hanging out at, at different types of uh, conferences and things. Most people have the perception that PAM is basically always an enormous headache that sucks up a ton of operational resources. I will tell you, I've seen implementations way back that, that were. So I think, I think we've got some, you know, sort of old prejudices that are, that are still out there and, and make people think, well, you know, th this is always going to be a problem. And, and so we really need to be careful about trying to, to, you know, sort of tackle something like this. But even though it encompasses a bunch of areas, endpoint management or privilege management, account management, you know, secure access models, it doesn't have to be a nightmare, nor should it be. And, you know, again, I think it really comes down to the solution providers 
and being very critical. I mean, certainly as a security professional and one that's even advised and helped craft RFPs for my clients around this, um, this is something you should be critical of. I am 100% about ease of use and especially around things like partner integration because PAM really is an ecosystem. It's tying into a lot of places. It's got to be one of your day-to-day hands-on solutions that you manage. And if it's hard to use, and, uh, you know, I actually always gauge this. Like, you know, if, if, if I see demos and I see things where you can just tell the complexity is, is enormous, you know, that's a red flag. You really need something that you, you can, you know, not only learn quickly, but you don't have to, uh, you know, have a PhD to be able to use effectively in a day-to-day sort of working environment. So let's go to the next slide. And I just want to sort of start wrapping up my discussion here by, by really, you know, sort of taking a step back and saying, well, what, you know, what is it we're trying to get here? What is it we're you know, sort of looking into these solutions for? And, and I think there's a lot of capabilities that we're after. I need things like session recording, right? Especially if this is third parties where I might need to forensically go back and say, hey, what in the heck happened here? You know, what, what, what might have occurred in an OPM type breach or in a Home Depot situation? You know, if I've got a centralized control, that would be huge. Um, I need the solution to be available, especially if a lot of people are relying on it. I need application support. Um, I need discovery capabilities. And I really need broad coverage of operating systems. I mean, most of our enterprises are a big mix of Windows and Linux and Unix. Um, and the more of that I can cover with one solution, you know, obviously the better off I'm going to be. So usability, big factor there. Interface design, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always one to scoff a little bit at reporting and, and pretty pictures. Um, but the fact of the matter is, PAM uh, is a solution you'll work with all the time. It won't be a, a set and forget. You're going to be constantly integrating and adding policies and, and doing things, and it needs to be easy to use. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I need authentication and activity monitoring. And, you know, what I always tell people is, is you know, if you're setting up for PAM or you're thinking about it, you really need to take a, you know, sort of hard look at your access control models altogether and say, you know, look, who are we allowing in? You know, who, where are they allowed to come from? What types of accounts are we uh, using? And what kind of privilege models do we have? And, you know, what you'll tend to find, especially in big shops, is that we, you throw your hands up at a point and realize you don't know all this. Um, you know, I, I can certainly speak from my experience in, in really big distributed organizations. You know, we tend to have some of this. You know, whether it's, you know, sort of the central core stuff in the data center, We've got some ideas of that. You know, we might have certain critical applications or platforms. You know, we tend to sort of have a grasp on that. But there's all sort of, you know, little loose ends all over the place that, you know, again, if you're being realistic and you're, and you're sort of being honest, you're going to admit that you might need some help with the discovery factor for what's actually in use out there. Let's go to the next slide. And so you need to limit that access and you need to limit privileged access, of course. Um, and, and ideally this comes back to sort of a combination of things, one of which is role, you know, sort of assignment. We want at least privilege model. I mean, that's one of the sort of few, I'll say axioms of our industry that still holds true a hundred percent. Least privilege is definitely something we should still be striving for and absolutely be looking for ways to implement. And that's the combination today in not only our on-prem environments, but most definitely in cloud-based environments of both network isolation and segmentation, as well as identity. So sure, yeah, we need gateways and some sort of a proxy to access model. You definitely don't want to just allow vendors to arbitrarily land on your network um, like a traditional VPN client. That's a recipe for disaster, not only in <laughs> sort of controlling that, but also monitoring for it. So that's a big factor, but you also need something to help define and control the role assignment to go with that too. So let's go to the next slide. So, you know, what are the best practices? You know, I'd say this is probably another Captain Obvious slide in some ways, because it's things that I think we've all been striving for for a while. Separation of duties to where it's reasonable. It's getting tough actually with things like DevOps. Um, least privilege, definitely, a, a, you know, again, a core concept. Strict password and account management policies. You've got to wrangle this. If you've got credentials hanging out all over the place, you know, go to the MITRE attack framework. It's pretty clear early on that's one of the core things any attacker is looking for in lateral movement scenarios. Um, we need to log and monitor and audit everything that's going on. And 
you know, again, we really need to isolate and control people that have privileges and the groups that they're in, system admins, privileged users. That number is growing. Um, again, especially as we move towards things like DevOps implementations, um, it's getting harder to sort of distinguish what the privilege levels need to be. But we still have to try, and we really need to try to, uh, to take a look and say, what's the sort of minimum level of access that each independent role within these types of teams for building and deploying applications anywhere? Um, you know, that, that's something that really needs more attention all the time. So let's go to the next slide. So I'll wrap it up before I hand it off to Chris. Um, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll just say, and, and maybe sort of recap, I think Pam, to me, is, is one of the more essential types of toolkits out there. I'm dead serious. This is, this is certainly something that I've seen be effective. I've seen people really get control over their environments. I've also seen people significantly limit, um, you know, sort of the potential disaster scenarios in those environments with Pam by, you know, really putting less control or, you know, or, or more control, rather, around each of the privileged user scenarios and applications that rely on that. Um, any PAM solution that's out there um, should ideally be a robust, relatively easy to put in place and manage. Again, it shouldn't take a year just to get it working. So it certainly shouldn't be so difficult that nobody wants to use it. And it really needs to be part of your um, completely holistic, overarching strategy for everything in the cloud. So again, a lot of misconceptions about, uh, about PAM out there. And I really just wanted to make sure we talked about those so everybody understands. Probably we've come a long way, <laughs> and it's it's time to sort of revisit this. So, Chris, take it away. Hey, thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, some really good information in there. So, my name's Christopher Hills. I'm the deputy CTO. Um, I wish I had as much experience as Dave did. Um, I have about 15 years experience in the IT industry with the last nine years focusing solely on privilege access management, developing, architecting, engineering, and actually being a, a strong advocate um, in a financial backing and financial industry, um, working with other companies to help mature their PAM strategies. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of a background about myself. Uh, next slide, Sarah. So the, the new era of universal privilege management, one of the, as we start in 2020, um, and we kick off the year, we really wanted to drive home um, what privilege access management used to be known as. It's no longer managing just the password. Whether we go back to Gardner or we go back to uh, Coopy Nicole or Forrester, we've really looked at um, distributed systems to manage all of these independent and, and uh, non-joined uh, management systems for PAM. And what we've done at Beyond Trust is we've actually complemented all of those and brought them together to provide a universal or unified means for privilege management. Uh, go ahead, next slide, Sarah. So what does that mean, the, the universal privilege management? What we've done is we've actually complemented not only the passwords, and when I talk about passwords, I also talk about SSH keys, the ability to discover them, the ability to manage them, rotate them, just like Dave was talking about, and also audit them. Um, in addition to that, the endpoint, the least privilege, removing that excessive admin rights. And one of the things and one of the misconceptions that obviously comes with that is, removing those admin rights away from the endpoints, uh, meaning the users that are using laptop steps, desktops and workstations. We also mean removing those admin rights from those Unix Linux platforms, from those Windows platforms. Service accounts that are configured to run on those systems are actually privileged accounts. So we also wanna be able to remove the admin rights away from them. And last but not least is the access uh, vertical of this. And when we talk about access, we talk about is that the help desk user gaining access to your iOS device or getting access to your system and controlling the means for which that happens? Or does that mean controlling your, your third party um, vendors that need access to your internal systems? So those three pieces we brought together, we've unified to provide an offering as we've cloned or named universal privilege management. All of these pieces are brought to you on a unified platform called Beyond Insight. So it's a single point of login, single pane of glass. Once again, ease of administration, ease of being able to manage as well as control all aspects of these three verticals. In addition to that, being able to offer them both as an on-prem, as a cloud, or a combination of the two in a hybrid situation. Mind you, all of these are backed currently uh, by a SQL 
database, which also accompanies the SQL analytics and reporting. So you have with this piece and this unification over 250 canned reports that apply to all three of these verticals. Go ahead, next slide. Kind of going back to what Dave says, you know, we talk about the threat actors and technology continues to grow. Um, as technology grows, identities grow. Um, and as identities grow, it, it provides an even larger threat scape um, for those threat actors. And, and if we look at, you know, the breaches um, and, and across uh, those breaches that have occurred within the industry itself, uh, essentially 80% involve some form of a privileged credential. So being able to control, being able to, to monitor, being able to rotate um, and truly have a, a full holistic approach on those privileged identities for, for managing it is absolutely critical. And if you look at the other side of the spectrum, you know, 70% of the attacks uh, include some type of a lateral uh, move within a network. So if you think about, uh, you know, the the evolution of, of, a, of a threat actor and what they do to elevate their rights and, and continue moving within your environment, you know, 70% of that are results of a, a lateral movement. And then in addition to that, when we talk about removing administrative rights, the, the Microsoft vulnerabilities that are exposed as a result of, you know, users having admin rights, that accounts for 88% of that, you know, and being able to stay patched and current and everything with those vulnerabilities and removing those administrative rights to be able to remove that threat vector um, is also critical. Go ahead, next slide, Sarah. So as we talk about, you know, what are the new requirements? Going back to what Dave mentioned, you know, being able to have a fast deployment, being able to have, you know, situational rights or just in time um, access for when it's need. Uh, what about, you know, the, the dynamic continuous adaption, being able to discover those accounts as they're presented on the network, you know, a fully automated approach. Um, and, and being able to provide that to the end users and trying to be as least intrusive as possible. So once again, we look at both sides of that. We look at the administrative side, the ease of use, the ease of deployment, the ease of management for operations. And then we also look at and take into account the end user side, making it as easy as possible as we can on the end users. Um, and then once again, having the granularity to, to expand across all three of those pillars um, and, and truly provide that, that universal management. Next slide, Sarah. So one of the things that that we talk about is, you know, and, and one of the things that I preach when when I when I talk to CISOs is you will find that no matter where or what company um, you go to, everybody's at a different point um, in their privilege management journey. And whether that's their PAM journey or whether that's, you know, their endpoint journey, um, all of these pieces and what we offer, it doesn't matter where you're at in your journey, whether you're focused on removing the admin rights or you're focused on your privileged accounts or non-privileged accounts, or you're, or you're focused on your DevOps. Anywhere in, in your journey, we can actually insert ourselves with our platform and continue to grow and mature that PAM strategy. And this kind of gives you an idea of, of the, the ecosystem, if you will, as it relates to PAM and this universal privilege management that you can start anywhere here and still end up at the same spot in the end as you continue to mature and grow. Next slide, Sarah. So one of the things that Dave talked about is the integration, the ecosystem. How can we integrate with, with you know, other companies, whether it be threat analytics, whether it be vulnerability management, whether it be SIM, you know, being able to provide that ecosystem through APIs, through plugins, through native integration um, is key. And having those, you know, additional pieces of integration will not only, you know, uh, make our product and our tooling invaluable um, to you, uh, but it also allows you to continue Continue growing and leveraging the tools that you currently own without having to have you know additional costs so keep that in mind also you know whether you're trying to integrate with the cloud you know we integrate with the cloud the identity management you know with SailPoint, with uh, Savient um, or, or even with uh, ticketing systems whatever they may be whether it's BNC ServiceNow we provide that full ecosystem to basically complement your, your existing infrastructure next slide sir 
So one of the great things that you'll receive today, um, if I'm not mistaken, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is busting the six myths about Pam. Um, we kind of talk about the exact same things that Dave says, and this kind of gives you that that guide that you can follow up through and, and, and kind of go through, you know, what truly are the six myths about Pam and how this can actually help you with not only your Pam strategy, but also your Pam journey. One of the things that we, we struggle with often is how we can relate to a board. Hey, we need to spend money on Pam. We all know, you know, finances are tight and budgets are, you know, constrained, but this truly helps you bring that dialogue to, to some of those people who make that decision. And so this is key. So hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy that and that'll be something, up, uh, something you'll be able to follow up with um, after this. And then last but not least, next slide, Sarah. I'd like to think that you know, this is kind of, uh, you know, bragging rights, if you will, but our, our statistics truly do show um, the value of, of what we offer. You know, we're a market leader um, in the PAM space, whether you're, you look at the gardener, where you, you look at Forrester or Cooper or Cole, um, we have 75 patents within the, you know, the, the PAM system. Uh, our, our renewal rates are driven, and, you know, 90% renewal rate. Uh, we have over 20,000 customers in 80 countries. Um, one of the things we don't talk about, it doesn't matter how large or how small the company is, doesn't matter what the industry uh, that you're in or the vertical that you're in, um, there is not a one size fits all. We do grow and we do adapt to your environment, whether it's a large environment or a small environment. So don't think that this is a, oh, I need a big enterprise you know, environment in order for us to be able to fit in. We truly do customize and partnership you know, with the companies that we work with to, for them to get the best out of their solution. So thank you, Sarah. The next slide, I believe, is the uh, Q&A and the poll. Back to you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, okay, let's go ahead and launch our poll of the session, and I'll give you guys a little bit more information about that white paper as well, just so you know, and then we'll jump into Q&A. So um, if you are interested in being contacted by Beyond Trust, um, we would love to schedule either a personalized one-on-one -on -one demo with you um, to talk about any of our products or solutions, or if you would just like to talk more about what Chris was just talking about with the universal privilege management concept um, or anything else um, in your panel. Um, needs. Um, so, so select yes. We would love to talk to you. Um, we'll even just, you know, sit down and talk about your horoscope if you'd like, um, whatever you want. So, um, but let's go ahead and dive into a couple of questions. Um, also, before I forget, um, you will receive a direct link to download the Beyond Trust white paper, Busting the Six Myths of Pam, um, but, and the file can also be accessed in the handout section, so to the right of your screen um, with the CPE doc and with the PowerPoint that we showed today. So you can download all of those together if you'd like right now, or that will be emailed to you um, within one to two business days. So let's go ahead and dive into some questions. Again, folks, if you have questions for us, just submit them into the chat box right now. Um, Dave, this came in for you. So why is achieving, quote unquote, complete zero trust unlikely? Well, yeah, and, and that's a good question. And, and it doesn't surprise me that that question came in because I, I think a lot of people feel like it is something that's attainable in, in some way or shape. But I, I'll tell you, I, I don't I think there's a couple of reasons specifically why. So number one, I, I think the it's a moving target, right, in terms of what we're actually trying to define. There's, you know, Google's like beyond court model. And if you look at the stuff that John Kinderbog originally did around zero trust with Forrester and, and so on, you know, they've got sort of a different twist on it. But I think the big piece of it is that we don't have full harmony between all of the elements needed to put it in place. So, and what I mean is, that, you know, look, you got to have some networking, you got to have some significant identity, and you've got to have a lot of sort of application awareness and enforcement mechanisms for all that right now those aren't 100 percent sort of working completely in tandem so i think it's actually very likely that you could get significant growth or progress in any of those areas but i think to collectively have quote unquote zero trust especially across uh, like a hybrid ecosystem between cloud and on-premise etc i think it's going to be a few years i think it's going to take some time for all of the solutions and control models to gel more effectively before we can even begin to say that we're gonna to get to that. Thanks, Dave. Chris, can you talk about the strides that Beyond Trust has made in 
the hyper-converged environment that differentiates us from other PAM providers? Absolutely. So the biggest thing is the architecture. So within the architecture itself, we're obviously in, in all three marketplaces as it relates to Google, um, Azure, and AWS. And what we have is, and what we're finding with a lot of our customers is the fact that they do truly have a hybrid environment where there are some systems, whether uh, you know it's a SaaS system or a, an MSP offering um, that's within the cloud, and they want to leverage that. And so being able to have not only your on-prem solution, but also a deployment within the cloud, whether it's for resiliency, whether it's for high availability, um, and, and melding those two uh, architectures together truly gives the best of, of, of both worlds um, when it comes to our architecture and you know whether it's an HA architecture or an active active architecture and it truly gives you that scalability that none of our competitors can offer today as it relates to PAM and a PAM offering. Thanks Chris. Um, I I think this might be for Dave, but maybe Chris can chime in too. What's the best practice for internal authorization for using a privileged account on a server? It's easy for contractors, but with a large dev team, it seems difficult for internal authorization. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a big question and I'm getting that a lot, especially with devs and, and you know, DevOps. And I think the reason is because they're used to, to, to sort of making the argument that they need, you know, full access to you know, pretty much everything to be able to do what they're needing to do. In terms of an authorization and sort of a, you know, talk maybe about account management there, you've got you've to have some sort of a centralization me mechanism. And really what it comes down to is having something, that there's, got, there's got to be some tooling in place, I guess is my thinking, that facilitates short-term access for performing privileged actions. Most of what a developer does on a day-to-day -day basis, writing code, Integrating into the pipeline and checking, uh, you know, checking code into a repository, <clears throat> even in, in things like the build environments, doesn't require significant privilege other than in those environments. To me, anything beyond that, they shouldn't just get unfettered access. There should be really carefully controlled accounts that they can basically check out for short periods of time or have sort of real constraints around, but there's got to be a a governance model that supports that, you know, again, a process to request the access, be placed into the appropriate groups, even on, um, you know, significant, you know, very fast moving dynamic DevOps teams. I've seen people successfully do that. Okay, Dave, um, another one for you. Why do so many organizations cling to quote unquote myths about PAN? Uh, I think it's just, it's easier that way, isn't it? <laughs> you know, we've, we've sort of, oh, I saw this thing back in 2004 that was a real debacle. Well, it's probably still that way. You know, I think, I think there's a lot of sort of, well, you know, it, we saw this thing or we heard this from somebody in the community. Um, you know, I, I had a friend in the community that had a problem, you know, so it's definitely a problem for everybody. It's just, it's just common. And, and, and I would say Pam's not the only, you know, major category of control that that probably has that but i think since pam is so big and covers so much and has so many deep sort of hooks into foundational elements of a security model um people tend to perceive that well since it's so you know broad in terms of scope and coverage and capability it, it must be incredibly challenging and it's got to be um you know something that that we're, we're probably incapable of putting in place right i've heard that so many times i, I think it's just easier to continue telling yourself that versus getting educated and finding out that, you know, there may be some solutions out there that, that aren't that way. Dave, wanting to talk about vendor remote access a little bit more. So what are your, what are you, what do you think are the biggest risks with vendor remote access? Um, oh, well, over allocation of privilege is a big one, right? So, so choosing the, you know, sort of least privilege model <clears throat> for vendors you know, it takes time just like anything else. And vendor scenarios are usually unique because you have a specific thing that you want them to be able to do. So, um, you know, that's something that I, I would say, you know, that's a big part of it. But the other part is just the actual remote, is, is the remote part. So, you know, traditionally, unless people have really designed and architected for like a bastion host or a jump box type model, they tend to just give VPN access of some type 
but but then you know in a lot of cases the vendor is essentially just another user on your on your network and i think it's difficult to corral that so the biggest risks you know there there's three there's creating the appropriate roles and, and, and privilege definitions and managing to that number two it's appropriately controlling and isolating their network access into the environment and i'd say number three it's monitoring those network uh, connections with vendor activity to make sure we know exactly what they're doing and limit um, you know, the capabilities they have as much as we can. Okay, guys, um, it is time to wrap up. Thank you so much um, for attending. Be on the lookout for that email with links containing um, the recording slides and the busting the six myths of PAM white paper um, by Beyond Trust. Um, thank you to Dave and Chris and everybody else who joined live today. We really appreciate your time and spending the last hour with us. Um, Dave, feel better. Um, <laughs> gurgle some salt water and drink some tea. And everybody yes. have a wonderful, <laughs> have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you guys at the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.